Uh, John Podesta, tell us what you're here for. This is a sustainability conference. Is that a particular interest of yours? Yeah, so uh, of course I was, when I worked for President Obama in the White House, my role was to manage the portfolio on, uh, on uh, climate change and, and uh, energy transformation. All of that's under assault now by the new uh, administration in Washington. Uh, but the, you know, the future of the planet depends on uh, us making uh, proper investments in sustainability, so I was glad to come over. How should the rest of the world the treat the United States? As you say, pulling out of Paris, they'll appear to be taking a much more unilateral position on all of this and a, a, a less concerned I, about climate change. Look, I think what the, the most uh, fundamental problem is what he's doing in the United States, uh, which is to really attack the fundamental pillars of uh, environmental protection with a 31% cut to the EPA, uh, uh, the beginning the process to, uh, to, to turn over the rules that President Obama put in place to uh, reduce emissions from uh, from the transportation sector, from the power plant sector, uh, from methane emissions, from natural gas production. So uh, the I think that whether he does, he's they haven't quite made up their mind about whether they'll pull out of Paris, about whether he does or he doesn't. He set the country on a course that is. Uh, Really uh, ignoring the science and ignoring uh, the tremendous cost that the that the United States and of course the world uh, will uh, will uh, be faced with as a result of climate change. Mm. You happen to be in London at a time, obviously, uh, coinciding with this hor horrendous incident in uh, in Westminster yesterday. When you were chief of staff at the White House under Bill Clinton, there were weren't events quite as similar as this. But I wonder what. I wonder how you think government should react to these atrocities. Look, I think you, you have to do uh, everything you can to protect the uh, people of your country, uh, investigate and, and try uh, to bring to justice uh, the people who are responsible. I know that uh, the assailant was killed yesterday, but there are others who appear to be involved and, and, and need to be arrested. Uh, but I think you also have to uh, try to re uh, retain uh, and uh, be restrained in terms of retaining uh, your ability to operate as, as uh, in a free and open way. And of course, what the terrorists want uh, is for us to change all that, and I think we, we have to resist that. And I think in the United States, uh, even uh, after 9-11, we found a balance being, uh, between uh, enhancing the level uh, of investment, the level of protection uh, to try to invest in uh, better uh, intelligence and law enforcement resources, uh, but also trying to maintain uh, an open way of life. And in rhetorical terms, you would be one of those saying you want to not ramp it up. You need to keep calm, so to speak. I think you have firm. to. I think you have to take it seriously. But I th again, I think you have to uh, be measured, uh, be calm, uh, and not play on the f uh, the fear that is uh, that is. You know, the, uh, probably the first reaction of the, uh, of the people, but try to say we've got to have a long-range uh, strategy that uh, meets the threat, that uh, pushes uh, uh, terrorism back across the board, across the world, uh, deal with the ideo ideology that's animating uh, the, the uh, people who would do us harm. Uh, but in the end of the day, to maintain that, uh, what's special about the freedoms that we enjoy. It's, um, it's five months now since the election, which Donald Trump uh, won. In a nutshell, what's your account of why he prevailed back in November? Look, I think uh, uh, he uh, appealed, uh, you know, I start from the proposition that we always knew this was going to be a tough election. It's hard to follow, follow a two-term president. Uh, the the Republican Party consolidated uh, around Donald Trump, so the country's uh, somewhat evenly split. But I think at the end of the day, uh, he uh, was able to convince uh, enough people uh, in places that have been left behind by the economy uh, to, to vote for him that he was able to prevail in the Electoral College. Uh, Secretary Clinton got three million more votes than he did nationally, uh, but he was able uh, to put together narrow wins in uh, Wisconsin, in Michigan, and Pennsylvania that uh, got him the victory 
uh, in the Electoral College. He had a little assist from the Russians, as we're finding out more from every day, uh, and a little assist actually from our director of our FBI, uh, who intervened right. in the uh, oh, last we'll 10 actually, days of I'll, the election. I'll come to those, I'm, but I'm interested in this account that says there was something going on potentially with Rust Belt workers, blue collar workers who didn't feel a connection to, to Hillary Clinton. Because that almost appears to be something of a pattern in other countries too. Uh, the, a, a difficulty for traditional parties of the left to appeal to what have been thought of as their, their core blue collar voters. Certainly here there's been a lot of talk of that. Uh, in France, the socialists are not even going to be in the top three in the right. presidential in the presidential race, it seems. I mean, is that, is that a, a problem for the left to work on, rebuilding that connection? I, I, I think that uh, you have to speak to the economic anxieties of the, of, of the uh, American people, and I think uh, Secretary Clinton tried to do that, and I think she had a program that was really gonna address uh, the, the fact that people's wages really haven't gone up uh, in, uh, since the, really the turn of the century. And uh, uh, President Obama had uh, strong economic performance. He had a lot of job growth, but it tended to be concentrated. Uh, and uh, again, just another statistic from the election, uh, the, in the counties that Secretary Clinton won uh, accounted for 64% of, of, of the national uh, gross domestic product. So she won in the places that were doing well, uh, but again, the places that felt a little bit left behind have felt betrayed by uh, trade agreements who felt disconnected uh, from uh, what was going on economically in the country. We, yeah. we uh, tried to argue uh, that her program was actually aimed at uh, improving their lives, but I think Donald Trump, uh, they, there was a strong demand uh, for change, and, and uh, Trump appealed to that, particularly with his anti-trade anti policies. Right, well, so what is it? and any immigration policies. Well, if you could rewrite one thing about that election campaign, what would you do differently? Well, uh, you know, I think that we knew that this was an issue. We tried to, uh, to, to make that argument. Uh, and uh, I think we probably emphasized the fact that uh, in, the, in the fall campaign that Trump was unfit and unqualified to be president. I think. Uh, the first 50 days of his administration proved that we were right, and I think we actually convinced the American people uh, that that was uh, right. true. How do you think liberal America should react to what we're seeing President Trump is doing and what he's like and his style of government? I think they are reacting to it. I think you see it out on the street. You saw it first the day after his inauguration with the uh, women's march marches that took place and you, are you, all across the country. And you support that kind of Absolutely. That approach? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm fully into the resistance. <laughs> uh, I and think what would happen if there was no resistance? I think that uh, uh, the uh, I think that w we would see uh, a growing authoritarianism that would that was uh, uh, actually uh, at the strategic core of some of the people who are closest to him, like uh, Steve Bannon, and and uh, I think he would try uh, to. As he's as he's uh, tried, I think unsuccessfully to do, intimidate the courts, intimidate the media, intimidate uh, opposition voices, and I think you know we've seen that played out uh, across uh, other places, particularly in in uh, uh, in, uh, in in Eastern Europe, and and it's not a pretty scene. So I think that resistance in in uh, in uh, by litigating against uh, the. Uh, destroying the norms of, uh, that have built up uh, in our democracy, uh, resistance on the street, uh, more activism uh, in the political sphere. Uh, there have been many new organizations started, uh, many people who are coming forward who want to run for office now. Uh, so I think that level of uh, interest and activism that has seized uh, the progressive community, I think, is. Uh, is you know I wish I wish that it, a little bit more of it had been expressed uh, uh, during on election day, but I think it's it's a healthy thing for our democracy. It's interesting because you use the word resistance, you're using the word authoritarian, and I'm not clear whether you're using those as metaphors for what you think Donald Trump is like, or whether you think no, I'm not. In seriously, he, he he would be a threat to American democracy. I think resistance. I think that his uh, atta uh, attack on the 
uh, federal judges who disagree with him, his attacks constantly on the media, uh, his uh, turning and twisting uh, anything that disagrees with him, calling that fake news, when of course he was the uh, he was the beneficiary of a lot of fake news that emanated uh, from uh, uh, from uh, his friend Vladimir Putin and from Russian sources, made their way into the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, system, propagated by social media, uh, and now for him to do that is really, tr I think, to try uh, to upend uh, and uh, disorient people from what what is reality and what uh, and what can be believed. It breeds cynicism. Uh, that's the first t uh, step towards uh, authoritarianism, in my view. But not an end to elections or democracy in the U.S.? I'm well, look, I think they, they do everything they can to suppress the voters who disagree with them. So uh, we've seen that uh, take place before the last election. I think uh, one, of the, one of the factors in, the, uh, in our loss in the state of Wisconsin was an effort uh, by uh, the, the conservative state government there to disenfranchise uh, voters by uh, onerous requirements to get to, uh, to, to let them get to the polls and, and uh, express their franchise. So yeah, no, I think that I think it's a, it's a very real uh, threat. I think what what uh, there there is uh, the uh, uh, the aim uh, of to try to destroy uh, the public sector unions to go after uh, uh, other sources of uh, po of uh, opposition of voice. Uh, the defunding of Planned Parenthood uh, in the United States is all part of. Uh, a, an attempt to acquire power. He's the 45th president. I mean, in a way, what you're describing sounds, well, unprecedented, really, in the history of American democracy, well, without, I think the, without you, I, the checks and balances or opposition or resistance. Or I, I think it's, it's certainly unprecedented in 20th, 20th yeah. century yeah. American democracy, uh, and it really is unprecedented in the history of, of our country. Uh, we're not talking about George W. Bush or certainly not George H. W. Bush, uh, who were conservative. I disagreed with many of their policies, but I think they were within, uh, by and large, the mainstream of, uh, of uh, democratic thought. I think we're in a whole different world uh, with uh, somebody who, uh, you know, to, to, to cite the latest example, accuses his predecessor of wiretapping him during the election uh, when uh, every uh, person who is a member of his administration from law enforcement to the intelligence says there's absolutely zero evidence Well, he of says, in, in, in fairness to him, he says he feels partly vindicated on that because it may be, we, the, we haven't seen the evidence, but maybe there were some incidental. No, he said at the beginning yeah. that President Obama ordered Wiretap, tapping yeah, of him. Which is slightly which that is a different. That was a lie. Yeah, yeah, right. Now, he was yeah. noted to lie during the campaign. And to, quite frankly, sometimes you can lie to the public and, the, and you get the political benefit of that. And I would say that in this case, uh, he was benefited from uh, what was unprecedented uh, by any uh, modern political standards. Uh, but now when you start lying in congressional investigations, if you lie to the FBI, that's a different story. That's a crime. It's been a, a huge drama not least election night itself. Now, you were there. You came out and you addressed the campaign uh, in the early hours, and something was going on behind the scenes there. Can you just give us an inkling of what was going on? You came out and, in a way, made a holding statement that we're waiting to see what the result is. Uh, and then very shortly after, Hillary Clinton, who had not made an appearance, conceded uh, to, to Donald Trump. And the story is that, that, that uh, President Obama phoned Hillary and said, you need to concede. What, what was going on then? What was the state of, of, of candidate Hillary at that time? It must have been Well, I, look, I think she was, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, obviously not expecting the result. I don't think we were overconfident uh, going into this election. We knew it was tight. We knew it was close. Uh, but we thought, uh, uh, the, I, I mentioned the, the FBI director's statement that was 11 days uh, before the election. We saw a dip in our polls as a result of that. We had sort of come back. We thought uh, that uh, while it was going to be 
close we thought we were uh, we were likely to be victorious. So it was it was devastating to all of us and and a tremendous disappointment I think uh, to her. Uh, and uh, she uh, did speak to the president that evening, uh, and I think she recognized the reality that those uh, states that I mentioned, uh, even though we uh, we won the overall vote by three million votes, we lost those three states by a, a combined total of 80,000 votes, and it was it was clear that uh, they had gone uh, the other way. Uh, there were recounts that subsequently happened in those states, but uh, it, it, it was uh, clear that he would have an electoral college uh, majority. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think after talking to the president, uh, she decided to uh, call uh, Mr. Trump. We were still looking for votes in various places in, in those states and uh, looking to uh, see whether uh, there were places that had been undercounted or, uh, or, or where uh, the vote shift could yeah. might might have, have changed things, and that was the purpose of of uh, my statement to the to the crowd. But in the end of the day, she did what she has always done, which is graciously accepted reality, moved forward, made her statement of the following morning, and has tried to uh, handle the loss with with the great dignity that she's always shown in public life. You mentioned the the Russian hacking, which was a, a help to the to the Trump side. In the big picture, how big a difference do you think the Podesta emails, uh, how big a difference do you think they made to the campaign? Well, look, I think it kept, uh, it was, uh, there was a corrosive effect of the combination of the hacking, then multiplying that with fake news that were really made up stories that were promulgated in social media. Uh, I think one of the things it did was it kept that whole idea of emails kind of alive at a low boil. So none of the particular emails were, uh, uh, many of them hardly got above the radar in the mainstream media. But in the social media, uh, there was a kind of subterranean effect. And I think it laid the groundwork when, uh, when uh, Mr. Comey came in and reopened the email investigation. Which then, was a different email, then, then completely eight different days, email affair, but, yeah, but the word email but, was... The, the public confused and, co and yeah. conflated all that, and eight days later when he said, never mind, there's nothing to this, uh, it still had a corrosive effect, on, I think, on the campaign. Well, and we saw that, as I said, we saw that dip. Uh, we saw a little bit of a comeback in the following weekend, but, it, but we, it, I think where it really hurt us with the voters were, that we needed, which were particularly uh, college-educated independent women and uh, non-college-educated uh, white women in particular. Mm. I mean, it's a dilemma for the mainstream media, the responsible press, as to, maybe some don't consider it a dilemma, I do, as to how you handle stolen goods, really. And the fact is, quite a lot of the material appeared to be true and appeared to be a true reflection of things that were being said behind the scenes and appeared to be interesting, potentially interesting to voters. On the other hand, the mainstream media does, doesn't want to be a willing complicit, uh, does not want to be complicit in the theft of intellectual property and, and, and the private property of people like yourself. What, what did you think as you saw your words, or words sent to you, being paraded in respectable journalists? Do you think it's they're doing their job, or do you think they should not be publishing? You know, look, I was just trying to deal with it on a, on a, on a daily basis. Uh, I thought that they, uh, the, the, the reflection of where they came from and the fact that there was substantiation that the Russians had hacked uh, my emails, the DNC emails, that WikiLeaks was an instrument of uh, an attempt by Vladimir Putin and the Russian Federation uh, to undermine our democracy, that could have been reflected in the press, and I don't believe it was until after the election. But and I think they knew that, uh, and they saw, and they, th and they uh, decided that it was more interesting, maybe more titillating, uh, to get into the kind of campaign gossip, which is what those emails were But they may not have felt sure enough, of on the unsure enough ground on that to, to report well, it, but they felt on the, sure. Well, the, on the day that WikiLeaks started releasing my emails, 
the director of national intelligence uh, and uh, the direct and the secretary of homeland security issued a statement on behalf of the entire intelligence community that the Russians were behind the hacks and so they may not have been sure about that but I don't know why they weren't sure of that because everyone else was the independent analysts who looked at it uh, traced it back uh, to the uh, particularly to the GRU units that were uh, that were active uh, and uh, you know I think that they they seem to feel right after the election that they were then certain of it but they didn't really I think reflect that and I think that was actually a failing on behalf of uh, of the mainstream media and particularly uh, you know some of the major news outlets in in in, uh, in our country like the New York Times D Donald Trump has always portrayed the leaks or the, the WikiLeaks releases as manifestation of the incompetence of the Democrats and yourself to, to guard your to guard your property to guard your emails is there a bit of truth in that as you as you look back over that what was there a kind of carelessness a, a sort of I, you know I don't think so I think that the, you know it was uh, it was a these are highly professional people yeah. Uh, the same thing could be said of the Bundestag uh, hacks or uh, the Norwegian Labor Party hacks or the hacks in Italy or the, uh, you know, what we're, what we're likely to see uh, coming forward in the French campaign and the German campaign uh, in the future. These were crimes uh, committed by highly sophisticated criminals uh, and they were, they were done and intended to, uh, uh, to harm our campaign uh, and to interfere in our democracy. We've also learned from intelligence sources that they hacked the Republicans. They just didn't release their emails. Yeah. We've talked a little about the, the, the left and the appeal of the left and the pitch of the left. I wonder if you could just reflect for us on Bernie Sanders' campaign and how damaging that was to Hillary's presidential run and whether you think there was kind of legacy from that, uh, that, that that she never quite recovered from. Well, look, I think he ran a very spirited uh, primary campaign. I think that uh, we put together a coalition, and obviously we won the popular vote in the Democratic primaries. We won the uh, elected delegates, and and but he ran the campaign. I think they knew that was likely to happen. He ran the campaign all the way through the California primary. Um, I think we consolidated the party uh, at our convention. Uh, whether or not there were some lasting impressions left of his uh, uh, pressure on her uh, from the left uh, is hard to say. I, I would say that the margins of the third party candidates exceeded the difference uh, between Trump uh, and, and Clinton in those, in those states that I mentioned. So whether he pushed some people to voting uh, for the Green Party candidate or uh, the, uh, the, the Libertarian Party candidate in the, on the election who felt like they just didn't, you know, they, they had a hangover from uh, his attacks on, on the secretary, it's, it's kind of hard to know, but, but there was, but we did see that that was the difference in the vote, in, at least in those, in those critical states. At the time of the primary, uh, Britain's Labour Party had, just before really, elected, uh, elected a, a leader who was more, if you like, in the Bernie Sanders mold than the Hillary Clinton mold, let's put it that way. Um, were you watching events in the Labour Party? Were they kind of telling you, oh, there's a, there's a mood for something more radical? And what were you thinking about what was going Look, on? Look, I think Hillary Labour? ran, yeah, of, co I, I, of course we, we, we were attentive to what's going on around the, uh, around the world, and we were attentive to, obviously, the Brexit vote uh, and, what the, uh, and what that meant. And uh, again, that kind of anger uh, that people were not being uh, uh, dealt fairly with in the global economy was present, I think, uh, in the vote on Brexit and was present in, in, in our own election. We knew all that. Uh, we were trying to uh, solve the real problems, and I think that that uh, the secretary ran a very uh, progressive campaign. I think the reason that uh, we won and won the nomination and won it, uh, won the popular vote in the primaries handily, uh, was we were pr uh, we were putting forward uh, a very progressive platform uh, that 
in the end of the day, we consolidated with Sanders uh, in, and the Democratic Party platform was uh, reflective of, I think, where uh, Democratic voters uh, were. And, and uh, Hillary had, I think, a very strong support amongst Democrats. I think, uh, again, I think where we fell short were, uh, were some of the more Republican-leaning independent women, which we thought we could bring over to our side uh, because uh, we thought that they felt like uh, Trump was unacceptable, and um, uh, and we we just we fell yeah. short with uh, with non uh, college educated women in particular. Let me just last, ask la one last one. I mean, where does the left go? What should the Labour Party do here? It's at a very low place in the polls here at the moment. Uh, what do the Democrats do to get back in 2020? Well, I'm th I think I'll probably uh, have a better view of the latter than the former, but I think I'd be that- I'd in the former as well. <laughs> <laughs> at least, let me start with the latter, which is that uh, I think what Democrats are, are doing is, is, uh, is uh, in the short term, is uh, trying to be oppositional to Trump, because they have to be. Uh, his uh, his uh, assault on the values uh, that uh, uh, every Democratic elected official uh, reflects uh, is extreme. And so I think in the next couple of years, you're going to see uh, basic opposition. I think we'll see what happens in the, in the midterm elections uh, and whether uh, the Democrats are, are rewarded for being in opposition. But ultimately, every election is about the future. So the, there'll be, I think, a, a competitive primary, a lot of people are likely to run uh, in, the, in the 2020 cycle, and they're going to have to have a program uh, that meets uh, the needs of, uh, of American workers, of the American people, how to empower uh, workers to get a better stake in the economy, how to create more equitable growth uh, in the economy. And I think there's going to be a lot to work with because of uh, the, uh, the, the fact that uh, Trump's uh, policies are so regressive, even the healthcare policy uh, essentially is robbing from the poor to give tax cuts to the rich. Uh, and we haven't even seen his tax bill coming forward. So I think there'll be a strong argument to be made that there's a better path uh, forward. Uh, here in, uh, in the UK, I think, uh, with respect uh, to uh, where, how the Labor Party uh, re-consolidates uh, uh, it's left flank with, with uh, more center, the center left side. I think that's going to be a process that's going to have to work itself out with voices uh, arguing uh, for uh, things that are, uh, uh, that, that uh, point towards political success. It's, I think, not enough to uh, simply be a, a, a sort of a, a voice of opposition if you have no strategy to be uh, viable and electable again. And I think that uh, ultimately that will be rewarded. John Podesta, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.